Welcome back to yet another video of me learning animation by widening my favorite show, Avatar The Last Airbender. In this video, I'll be tackling Sokka as he falls for Suki for the first time, literally. I chose this sequence as I feel that there's a lot of challenges from the intricate backgrounds, the panning shots, and especially the motion shots. I also work on completing changing the composition of some of these shots to go from looking like this to this. So stick around to see how I achieve these feats. But before we get started, please leave a like if you had fun watching, subscribe if you want to see more, and most of all, please enjoy this video. The first shot I handle is going to be a simple one of Sokka stepping up towards the hut where the Kyoshi warriors are training. I filled out the shades and colors on the right side as I pictured what this hill or mountain could end up looking like. The left side has a lot more going on and to save myself some time, especially since I know that scenes near the end are going to take so much of the aforementioned time, I took a bunch of the existing leaves and placed them around the blank spaces. I also added marks on top of the selections to make them appear more seamless with the original. Luckily I didn't have to do any drawings of Sokka himself, at least not yet and I just worked on his shadow on the ground. Let's go towards the door as we see a closer look at Suki and her fellow Kyoshi warriors doing some drills. A viewer mentioned I tried using a grid to better place my subjects on the screen, so I decided to give that a try for this specific scene. I moved the picture over a little bit and then I used some solid colors to work on the walls, but I wanted the door to be a bit wider than what's seen over here so I promptly added extra lines to increase the horizontal aspects of the room. Sokka makes his entrance soon after and I make some rough sketches to outline the rest of his body. This was soon accompanied by coloring in the outline to make this a completed task. The next scene we have Sokka peeking his head over the wall. It's another simple one as I add onto the foliage on the left and the wall on the right. Sokka does make his way inside, but he does it all within the original 4x3 frame, so there wasn't really anything else that was required from me. I'm breezing through these scenes and I was feeling great. But just like always, I run into a scene like this that puts me back in my place. Due to the scene including a zoom, I first attempted to create the background without any people or objects blocking, so I can place each character on top and zoom everything at the end. That way I can use a camera layer to make everything very seamless. But as I was in the process of this work, I realized that it might be a little bit harder than anticipated, especially trying to get the motion in one size and position. So I did what I do best and decided to start all over again. Instead of redoing the entire background, I simply extended the side over here, while keeping most of the original art the same. I then worked on the keyframing which was what I thought would give me the hardest time, but this was actually a pretty smooth process, albeit a long one. Once the keyframing was done, I did the miracle work of giving Suki her hand back, but I soon felt like something was off. The frame felt very empty and I knew that I had to add one more Kyoshi warrior here. Just to make sure, I went back to the original animation and counted how many warriors there were. The numbers varied all over the place from 5 to 6 to 4 to 7 to none. But it seems like the average is 5. I took a copy from the warrior on the left and pasted her to the right. I also got all of the frames where she moves around and replicated them, and all that was left was to keyframe the warrior to match the rest of the scene. This took so much time because I couldn't get the pacing quite right, Using either the linear or smooth keyframes caused inconsistent resizing that didn't match the pace of the original, so I decided I needed to brute force it the whole way through, and after adding the missing limbs from the people in the back, I was finally done. The next scene is a lot easier in comparison to the previous one. I put my focus on the items in the foreground as I'm aware that the foreground and background move in somewhat different speeds due to the parallax effect. So after the shadowy items were done, the background was next. And I know that it's still only the fifth scene, but this room has way too many lines and I'm... Frankly, I was just done with it. If I was doing this in Procreate Dreams without the straight line tool like I was doing a few months ago, then this for sure would have been the end of me. But I guess having all of these lines does definitely make it easier to know where everything should go in the background, so I guess there's that. 
Once all of this was done, I knew it was time to keyframe both pieces individually, and here is how the past couple of scenes all turned out together. The beginning portion of this work is definitely on the simpler side, minus the zooming shot, and all things considered, I'm very pleased with how it all turned out. Going back to Clip Studio Paints, we have Suki doing her best Chin Sok impression of his best Ha Jung impression. Now that's a very specific reference that I wonder if anyone would understand, and now I'm wondering if I should just leave it in. Luckily for me, this specific scene doesn't require any moving or zooming or anything like that. To give more space to the shot, I added a Kyoshi warrior on each side, but to break from the similarities of just the copy and pasting, I also edited them a bit to give them different poses. Moving on, and I gotta say that I prefer these close-ups of backgrounds more than the wider views because it requires less lines and can also allow me to focus on the details better. It's definitely less of a headache this way. But speaking of further away backgrounds, we can move on to this shot of Suki and Saka conversing. There's more of the same here, so to move along more quickly, here I did the backgrounds and added another warrior to accompany the ones we have on screen. Saka has another close-up soon after his prior one, and much to my chagrin, it's at a slightly different angle from the one I worked on earlier, so I couldn't simply copy and paste. I re-added all the lines to the door, the walls, and the roof, and that was a nice quick work done. Honestly speaking, this video might as well be called Lines, Lines, and even more Lines because this scene is just that as well. Luckily at this point, this isn't new to me anymore, so the background came along fairly quickly. I'm going to breeze over this part just because I know that we're going to be entering the more difficult scenes very very soon. In this shot, Sokka gets pushed back by Suki, and after working my way through the interior of the hut, I had the added pleasure of drawing the rest of Sokka's body. I also plugged Sokka earlier in the frame since I moved the shot over to the left side. Moving on to our next scene in our background drawing simulator, and I'm going to try my best to speak to the parts we've gone over already. This scene is relatively simple with minor panning shot near the end, as Sokka gets flung again. And by flung, I mean he literally goes flying. That's rough, buddy. Some people just never learn. What's bad for Sokka is actually good for me because this little altercation that he has is only a slight movement at the very end of the scene, so animating it wasn't really that bad in the grand scheme of things. This next scene is where I start to mess with the composition a little bit, but before we get to that, we have to work on everyone's favorite section, and that's the wall, the floor, and the roof. Now, I could have made this scene very simple and leave just as fast as Sokka enters, but the more I looked at it, the more I knew that I wanted to mess with this furthermore. What I ended up doing was moving Sokka himself over to the left side, while I left Suki and the others to the right. There was the one challenge of masking out Sokka and placing him in his new position, but the other challenge was to add in the parts of the background that was originally covered by the ragdolling Sokka. This meant working on Suki as well. I then made the background white just to give myself a better view of the inking I was doing. Changing up the composition took a very long time and during the process, I wondered if it was even worth it. But after seeing the final results, I was very pleased with how it all turned out. I figured it's been enough time to show another portion of the work I've done. This may be another short segment that I'm showing off, but even something short like this took quite a lot of time. I knew animation is a timely process, but nothing could have prepared me for this when I first started the project as a fun little way to learn something new, like animation. Even though I mentioned before that I wasn't quite sure if I was happy with my decision to relocate Sokka's poor body, seeing it like this definitely makes me think the time it took was worth it. I feel like it helps make these scenes that were originally drawn for 4x3 not feel cramped in this new aspect ratio. This upcoming scene doesn't have anything new, at least nothing we haven't seen before, and it would be super easy for me to just skip over it since there's nothing left for me to say, so that's exactly what I'm going to do. Unfortunately, I'm unable to do the same for this shot right here. 
This is probably the most difficult scene in the entire video. When I originally planned to work on this selection of scenes, I definitely had the most worry for this particular section. Not only do we have some zooming, but we also have panning in one direction, panning in the other, characters leaving and entering the frame, and all in all it's just a chaotic couple of seconds. But, like anything else in life, I knew that looking at the long laundry list of chores at once can get very overwhelming, so I knew to tackle everything one step at a time. The very first task I chose for myself was to work on the left side of the frame and keyframe that alone. In this way, I don't have to worry about matching both sides at once. It was a bit of a struggle, I'll be honest, getting the frames to match up, and despite the amount of time it took, this process honestly wasn't all that bad all things considered. Once I got past the zooming motion, the rest of the panning left and right was a nice turn your brain off and get to work type activity. The right side was more of the same as the left side, you know, the only difference being, well, it, it was the right side instead of the left side. After getting the keyframe of the walls done and over with, my attention went on to the two characters dancing for the first time with each other. They occasionally leave the frame so I had to work on adding onto their body, and I gotta say this was definitely a nice change of pace from the constant background work I had to do. It was nice being able to draw the characters as I had to work on all things from Sokka's back to his arms to his head, and of course Suki isn't immune from this treatment, so I drew her in too when the moment called for it. I exported the video as is just to see if it looked good enough to move on with the coloring or not, and here is that clip. The scene is moving quite fast, but from what I can see, I'm very pleased with the result of the inking and the keyframing, so I knew it was time to move on to the coloring. The characters in this show having one main color they're rocking definitely makes it easier to work with. There's usually one base color and then a shadow color, and after another bit of time, this originally thought out behemoth of a scene was actually finished in a timely manner. And by timely, I mean completely not timely because this took freaking forever. Luckily, the next scene is a palette cleanser. It's the complete opposite experience from what I just did. All that was required of me was to add in the blurred lines to indicate Sokka being twirled around at light speed, and that's exactly how fast I was working through this one. The next scene is our second to last one, and it's very straightforward as well. So besides working on the background, there really isn't much else to comment on. So moving forward with that, we finally reached the ending scene, and as happy as I was, I definitely wasn't prepared for this monstrosity of a finale. Due to the amount of movement occurring, I wanted to focus on making everything seamless in the background. That's why I decided to take one of the last frames, and use portions of the earlier frames to fill out parts where Asaka is blocking out either the background or the Kyoshi warriors. After that, I had to add on to the missing image with the blank spaces on the left, and good thing the floor takes up so much space. At this point, I could have simply had the scene play out like normal, and have Sokka and Suki here in the middle, but as we learned in an earlier scene, I don't really like having this empty space on the side. That's precisely why I decided to move these two lovebirds more to the left, and give the whole image room to breathe. This is where the majority of my time went. The actual task of using the selection tool to mask out the characters itself wasn't hard, but my goodness was it tedious. My back was definitely hurting, spinal, and it's honestly still hurting right now as I'm recording this. I'm just glad I worked on the background first as it made it easier to just plop down Sokka and Suki without messing with the other pieces. But yeah, I'll let this play out a little bit longer just so you can see how the masking went. After I placed down the last of Sokka, my next move was to, well, move the backgrounds to match the positioning of the original. And after all that, I just needed to add the shadows and some shaking as Sokka makes a hard thud, and that was that. Time to finally showcase my final completed scenes of Sokka falling hard for Suki. I'm definitely planning on taking a nice long nap after the recording and editing process. Now, talking about the animation, the interior shots of the hut were super painful to do, especially with how many lines I ended up having to draw. I definitely do miss the shots where the characters were outside, and I definitely miss the simple icebergs from the first few videos. Anyways, despite the struggles with my time, my lack of skill, and my back, this video was a whole lot of fun. 
Besides, that one Zuko scene from a couple videos back was definitely way worse and I'm so glad I don't have to relive that one. I did have moments where I changed up the composition in my prior remaster avatar video, but unlike that one, I'm very happy with my decision to change it up in this video. The show was intricately designed for this 4x3 aspect ratio which I feel adds a lot to the charm of the original, so it was nice trying to add a wider ratio while still keeping the magic. I don't know how much longer I can go on with this project, especially if we start moving on to sections with 3D objects, and I'm definitely not looking forward to the episodes with intricate building designs like Omashu, but I guess we'll just worry about it when we get to it. That's pretty much it for this video. Please check out my previous video where I try out an original animation for the first time using the tips and tricks from this avatar series. Please leave a like, subscribe if you want to see more, and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much, and bye.